It's a great thrill to be in this morning service and to introduce our next speaker. Because of the indomitable energy and spirit she has in her 66th year, she probably should be in a laboratory somewhere being studied. Because of her freshness, her faith, her focus, after 43 years in the same church, if there's ever a celebration of great saints, call her name. If anybody ever builds a pantheon of great Pentecostals, put her in it. Just look around you where you are, and that speaks eloquently of who she is. Would you welcome to the pulpit of the Pentecostals as you stand, the wife of the senior pastor, Sister Vesta Mangan, and may God bless you. Dr. Klepper, he's in the house. I want to give him an ovation worthy of his name. Do you think that's good enough? He's in the house. Preachers in all of the world are in the house. The greatest men and women of God in all the world are in the house. Clap your hands, jump up and down, rejoice. God is in the midst. I will remember. He who wrote the drama is in the house. One more time, I just love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> Standing by my kitchen window three years ago, I saw a big truck hit a motorcycle and send the victim flying through the air, landing on the highway and rolling over apparently dead. Hurriedly on foot, I ran to see a motorist, a stranger, if you will, slam on his brakes, jump out of his car, and quickly run to the young man falling down upon his knees. He put his mouth to the mouth of that young man and literally breathed life back into his lifeless, broken body. I'll never forget it. Proverbial motorcycle victim, you are in this audience today. You have been hit by that big truck of devastating and near fatal circumstances. But prophetically, I tell you, because of the times 93 will be somewhat like the compassionate motorist giving mouth to mouth resuscitation, breathing life hope, vision, passion, and action back into your lifeless form. You will finish the work that you have been given to do, and you will perform the greatest acts you have ever performed, if you will have it, if you will not shoot down those planes that's coming to feed you, you will have it. The work of the temple had lagged and finally stopped in the days of Zerubbabel. But by the mouth of his holy prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the old man and the young man, God said to Zerubbabel, the director of the work of the temple, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Don't be afraid of these kingdoms. 
I will overthrow them and destroy them. And before these, Zerubbabel, every great mountain shall become a plain. I will perform the determinant, the determinant, the determinant counsel for knowledge of God. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And as for you, Zerubbabel, you are as a signet, a very precious jewel to me. My signet speaks of my authority and my honor. Zerubbabel and proverbial motorcycle victim, I will give you authority. I will give you honor. I will finish the temple, for I have chosen you from this day. I will bless you. I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And the glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. It's my determined will. It's my determined will. Get it. Then Zerubbabel stirred up the people. And the temple was finished with greater glory than the former. And on the eve of the third millennium, and on the authority of God's word, unalterable, unchangeable, inerrant, inspired word, I want to stir you up and tell you the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Not many believed it, but you that knew, the best is yet to come. Don't shoot me down yet. Don't shoot me down. I got something good for you. The best is yet to come. You just wait and see. The devil thought when Jesus Christ was crucified that it was all over. He thought when he persecuted and scattered the first century church, he had stopped it. The devil is a loser. He ought to know that by now. The church is a winner. Fair as the moon. Clear as the sun. And terrible as an army with banners. The church best days are ahead. The clouds are full of rain. There's about to be an explosion. There's about to be an explosion. The fuse is running down now. There's about to be an explosion. The church best days are upon us. The former rain and the latter rain in the same time. For we're going to gather in this harvest. Tell the whole world we're not done yet. Get out of our way. We're on our way. God in human shoes said, I must work the works of him who sent me. Not I hope to. Not I intend to try, but he declared forcefully, I must, I must, I must, I must. And that little word must expressed absolute determination. Jesus said, I've got a determination. I will finish what I've been sent in this world to do. I must finish that that has been determined for, ordained for me before the foundation of the world. Shout it with me. I must. I must. I must. I must. I must. No matter how rough may be the way, I must. No matter how many times I got to stop and pray, I must. I must. I must is the determination of God. I must is the determinate counsel of God. I must is the foreknowledge of God. And the foreknowledge of God is an advanced determination to carry out a plan which He has eternally purposed in the counsels of His own will even before the foundation of the world. It's already determined. Please, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard work. The Lord God has determined 
God has determined. I've made up my mind. I'm going to work with His determination. I don't care what nobody else does. He's determined. And I'm going to be determined to carry out His determinate will. Does anybody hear me? I don't believe you do. I don't believe you've got the picture yet. God's determined to fulfill His purpose. And I've made up my mind. I'm going to determine with Him. Everybody join Brother Kilgore and say, count on me. Count on say it to God Almighty, count on me. Count on say, I'm determined. Count say, I must. You may be seated. Then, remember, the Lord God determined to have a church, a people whom He could love, fellowship with, and share the rule of this universe with. A church called by His name, purchased by His own blood. A church indwelt, infused, baptized with His Spirit to share His rule and His glory. That is the determinant counsel, not of the Mangans or the Urshans or the Tinnies or the Kilgores. Or no. That's the determination of God. Clap your hands and say, my God, wake me up to the determinate counsel of God. It is the determinate counsel of God. It is the determinate counsel of God. That is the determinate counsel of God. As much as it was the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God that Jesus Christ be crucified and slain, was it? He therefore determined that in every age and in every dispensation he would call out a people and use them and bless them to further and to finish the determinate counsel of God if they would have it. That destiny, that foreknowledge, that determinate counsel of God is written into every area of my life. But if I live against that destiny and do not with a must avail myself of the spiritual powers, gifts, and mighty weapons available to me to fulfill this destiny, this determinate counsel of God. I'm going to get hurt, I'm going to suffer loss, and I will never be able to cry with Him. It is finished. I wind up a loser, and I will never finish what I've been sent and breathed into this world to accomplish. Count on me, God. You have determined that I can be a, a laborer in your vineyard. And I'm determined to be that. And I'm going to cry every day. I must. I must. I must. Let me hear that all over this building. I must. 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 I must work the works of him that sent me. And Jesus used the imperative must over and over again to portray specific priorities in his life so that he might finish the foreknowledge. I hope you get it. It's the determinate counsel of God to do what we're doing here. If you'll have it. If you won't shoot us down. If you'll receive it. God's determined to do something in this meeting. A must ruled his life. And that is why he was able to say on the night before Calvary, I finished the work thou gavest me. Much was left to be done, but what he was supposed to do was finished. For us to fulfill the determinate counsel of God, a must, must rule our lives as well. Please hear me now and get the picture. I will forever be a little lady, but hear me. Just before Calvary, as he ministered in one of the villages, a group of Pharisees came to him with a stern warning. Get out and depart from here because Herod wants to kill you. I don't care what the problem is. That didn't faze him, not one iota. Because the determination of God was in him to fulfill the determined will of God that was foreordained from the beginning. And he said, I ain't going nowhere. Hmm. 
He responded promptly and fearlessly. You go tell that fox. And I want you to leave here telling that old fox. You go tell that fox. Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day, and I shall be perfected. I'll finally get through, and then you can try it on somebody else. But as for me, I ain't going nowhere. Go tell that old fox what I did yesterday. I'll do today, tomorrow, and the day following. I will finish that that has been decreed and determined for me before the foundation of the world. I'm going to keep on keeping on till I finish. I don't hear what nobody's got to say. I got my focus. I know what God sent me to do and I'm going to do it. I ain't going nowhere. I ain't got shook. Ah, uh -uh. No, it's determined and I'm determined to finish my race. Snatching every soul I can out of the burning and praying without ceasing. I'm going to keep on. You go tell that old fox, I won't quit. I ain't going to run hide. I ain't going to step aside. I'm going to finish all I've been sent in the world to do. Say, I must. Uh, Say, it is written. Amen. It's written about me as it was he. I've got to do something. Go tell Apollyon, that old destroyer who leads the forces of destruction, what I did yesterday, I'll do today, tomorrow, and the day following, until I'm finished. I must. Go tell Belial, that old utterly worthless one, I ain't going nowhere. Go tell that old serpent he's crooked. There's nothing straight in it. I'm going to finish. Go tell every gossiper and every devil and every accuser of the brethren that wallows in slander. That's I ain't right. listening. I don't want to hear what you got to say in my ear on the telephone or nothing else. I got my mind made up. I got my focus. Go tell him. Go tell him. Shout it. Go tell him. Go tell him. Go tell him. Go tell him. I'm not listening to you. I'm going to finish. Go tell the enemy who sows weeds to confuse and mixes a little right with wrong, and a little truth with error, and some of the world with the church. Tell him I ain't moving. Go tell him for me today, I ain't moving. He can't do nothing but kill me and then gnaw me and chew on me. He can't touch my soul. That's what's got me moving here today. I'm not moving. I'm determined. I must. I got my mind made up. I'm not going to stop. Go tell that old fowler who has set a trap for me. I know his wiles. I'm not ignorant of his devices. You go tell him, the old God of this world that blinds the minds of men and turns them against the saving gospel of Jesus Christ and the love of God. I'm a city set on a hill that cannot be hid. Just like a cork. You put it under and it'll come right back up. You can't destroy somebody that's got their mind made up to do what God wants them to do. You can't stop them. They'll just pop up someplace else. Just shout, I must. Just say, I must. Say, I'm determined. Because he's determined. He's determined that I can make it, and I'm determined I'm going to make it. That is awesome. Awesome. Go tell that old hinder who's tried to hinder me from finishing my church and my task and reaching my city. Go tell him the kingdoms of this world is going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. Just go tell him that. Just go tell him. Just go tell him that one little angel is going to bind him and cast him into a bottomless pit. Go tell him that today. Go tell him this church, you ain't seen nothing yet, buddy. If you think you're hindering us, you're helping us. You may scatter us, and you, but we'll go to our knees. And you ain't seen no trouble yet, devil. What I did today, I'll do tomorrow and the next day until. Say, I must. I can't hear you men. In the balcony, say, I must. Say, I'm determined. Say, go tell that old fox. Go tell him. God, now you be with us. You put this in the spirit of every man and woman in this auditorium. You let a must get a hold of them. You let a determination that the devil and all of hell can't stop. Don't be afraid to clap your hands and get up and shout. We're a victorious people.
You may be seated. Go tell that old liar. He was a liar from the beginning and he's still a liar. Go tell that old murderer that he aims to slay everything that is noble and decent in our lives. I'm covered by the blood. Go tell that old questioner who asked, hath God said, in order to put doubt in your mind. The Word is the only thing that will stand. Everything you've got going under. But the Word is the only thing. Only thing. Only thing. You better get in it and know it. And I have to pause and tell you there's a famine for that Word among us. And that's why many are confused and don't know when something hits them they can get up and go again. You've got to get into the Word. Go tell that old roaring lion. I ain't stopping to talk to no roaring lion. You don't talk to roaring lions. You get out of their way and leave them alone. I run from lizards, let alone snakes and lions and roaches. Go tell that old wicked one who energizes every rotten deed that is performed by every foul spirit through every fallen soul on this planet. Go tell that old fox what I did yesterday, I will do today, tomorrow, and the third day I will be perfected. And perfected means I will complete. That's what perfected means. I will complete. I will finish all that you gave me to do when you let me marry Gerald Mangan. Because he told me if you get in my way, God will kill one of us because my ministry is first. I said, no, Gerald, if you don't want me, somebody else does. Don't ask God to kill me. I'll just get out of your way. You know, he didn't give me an engagement ring. He said, you'll either pray one hour a day, fast one day a week, or we won't be engaged. I said, I can handle that. But don't pray for God to kill me to get me out of here. Some other man wants me. He said, well, I want you to know I'm going to finish all that God gave me to do. I'm going to finish it. It's determined. I made up my mind and a must was planted in my soul and I said, a must. And every day he comes here with that must. Say, I must. I must. Don't get in the way of somebody's got a must in their soul. They'll move you down into the Mississippi Gulf. You don't get in her way. I know that. See, I know every bit of that. You don't have to step aside. You don't have to get out of the way. If you know the determinate counsel of God and you've got a must, you don't have to move out of the way. I must. Now follow me. When I say shall, you say nay, okay? You may be seated. When I say shall, will you say nay? Shall tribulation? Nay. Or distress? Nay. Persecution? Nay. Famine? Nay. Nakedness? Nay. Peril? Nay. Sword? Nay. Keep me from finishing? Paul said, Nay, for I'm determined that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, regardless of difficulty, regardless of opposition, regardless, I must, come on, shout it. Say, I'm determined. Go tell that old fox. I got my mind made up. I must. I'm not listening to him. You may be seated. Jesus said, I must suffer. And that's what you don't want to do. But if you're going to finish, you're going to suffer, ma'am. Sir, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to suffer if you finish. You'll suffer. You'll get hit by that big truck. And you better hope a church is compassionate enough to put their mouth to your mouth and breathe life back into your breathless body. He said, I must suffer and even be rejected. But say, I must. I must, I must be about my father's business. I came to seek and to save that loss. A must, a must. I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also. For because of this purpose, I've been sent into the world. Jerusalem, Samaria, uttermost parts. It is determined. I can't hoard it in just one church in Alexandria or in Baton Rouge or in Shreveport. It's for everybody, every city, everywhere. God has determined to fill this whole earth with this. We're in the right thing if we'll just get a must, a must. I must, 
I must. I say it. I must. I must. I can't hear you. Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. I must show to the world that I love and care about just one lonely soul, even if he's a reject and hated by the city. I must have a house-to-house -house ministry. I'm going to your house. I must have a house-to-house -house ministry. I must have a neighborhood prayer watch and cover my neighborhood. Don't have time. You'll hear about it in the morning. I came to seek and to save the Lord. I must. I must. I must. I must take advantage of every opportunity. Every opportunity. For the night cometh. For the night cometh. I'm going to take advantage of every day. When my feet hit the floor, that's another day to pray. That's another day to knock on a door. That's another day to put the word in somebody. That's another day to snatch somebody from the burning. They're missing. They're going. They're slipping. They're gone. They're plunging into hell, folks. I must. I must. No good times. Whatever. I must suffer. I must cry. I must go to other cities. I must. Come on and shout it again. I must. I must work the works of him that sent me. Don't you understand? There's got to be, say, miracles, signs, wonders. Say, I must do something every day. I must go to the other side. Legion is waiting there for me. I must deliver that city from terror and give them a gospel witness. I must go through Samaria. There's a soiled woman there that's going to meet me at Jacob's well. She's the key to the revival in Samaria. I must. I must. I must go to Calvary. I must suffer. I must pray. I must fast. I must win souls. God in human shoes saying, I must. I must. I must. I must cooperate, cooperate with the determinate counsel of God. And then he said, I have given you an example. And this example should be the master passion of every Christian in this world. He's in the house. He's listening to your sermon. He's listening to your everyday conversation. And he knows where you're walking, where you're talking, how many you left that you never witnessed to. I'd love to stop there and tell you just in the last week of the month, but I just have a certain amount of time. The preacher, above all, ought to be a passionate seeker after the souls of men regarding nothing else. For if you ever get that soul in contact with God and keep it there, everything else will fall in place, I promise you. And all of that Jesus came to do we are to teach and we are to finish. So it must be the church number one priority. And everything else will fall in place. A determination must dictate, motivate, drive us, compel us, say every day. Amen. If we are to finish all that we've been sent in the world to do and we have not finished. And there's got to be a must born in everybody here this morning. A determination because God has determined some things concerning you and your ministry and your city. And you've got to cooperate with him for you to finish it and determine what he's determined. Say, I must. Amen. Now I ask you, do you think Jesus Christ knew what was important? Do you really? He spake as never a man spake, but Jesus Christ prayed as never a man prayed because prayer was the secret of his determination and perseverance right. to finish. He had never finished if he hadn't prayed. Jesus Christ was a fanatic. Anybody who would say, pluck your eye out or cut your hand off or cut your foot off or eat my flesh and blood, you think we're fanatics. He was a fanatic, but especially about prayer. And Mr. Churchill said a fanatic is someone who cannot change his mind and will not change his subject. Jesus Christ was a fanatic about prayer. He never did change it. He never did change it. Never did. He has not changed his mind and he will not change his subject. God, just get that, God in human shoes offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. God in human shoes giving us an example of how to finish. I must finish. And to finish I must pray fervently, diligently, consistently, persistently, constantly, determinedly. I must I must. More than 20 times the Gospels call attention to Jesus' practice of prayer. Prayer was his life, and his life was prayer. Did he know what was important? If prayer is that important, if Jesus did it, and if it does make that much difference, why don't we do more of it? Say, Jesus prayed. Say, God in human shoes 
prayed. Prayed standing. Prayed kneeling. Say kneeling. kneeling. Say God in human shoes. Fell on his face and prayed. He prayed in the morning at the gateway of the dawn. He prayed in the evening when the day's work was over. He was accustomed to spending whole nights in prayer. Great crises were preceded by prayer. Jesus prayed. Say it. Jesus prayed. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Great sorrows were faced with prayer. Great decisions were preceded by prayer. The choosing of the twelve was made only after a whole night spent in prayer. Great achievements were followed by prayer. Oh, lest the flesh get advantage. Prayer had priority over his social life, over his physical rest. He prayed in his suffering. He prayed in joy. He prayed when popular. He prayed when he was unpopular. God in human shoes fortified his flesh by prayer. He prayed in the mountains, in the deserts, in a garden. Those were his favorite spots, but he prayed everywhere. Even in the midst of crowds, he experienced solitude of prayer. Near the close of his ministry, these poignant words occur, and hear me. Everyone went to his own home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives and spent the night in prayer. We've never done that, folks. Say, so I must. And we'll never get confused and there wouldn't be enough of devils in hell to stop us in the air, in the heavenlies or on earth. There wouldn't be enough to stop us. Say, I must. Say, I must. I'm not talking about Reese, Howley, and Bounds, Praying Hyde, Fletcher, David Brainerd, John Knox, or any other of the giants of prayer of the yesteryears. I'm talking about God in human shoes. I'm talking about Jesus Christ spending the night in prayer, falling on his face, praying with strong crying and tears. This was the watershed of his life and ministry, praying on his feet, praying on his knees, praying on his face, God Almighty, why in the world are we so late in waking up that we got to pray without ceasing? The busiest life, no doubt, that was ever lived. He worked under constant pressure. At times, he had no leisure for meals. But whatever the pressure, he made sure that prayer did not become a casualty. Rather, he devoted extra, extra time. I must, I must, I must, I must tell you today, we need more human shoes. Wrestling in a garden. More human shoes praying all night on a mountainside. More human shoes rising a great while before day, praying at the temple's gate. He began his ministry on earth with prayer. He finished it with prayer on the cross that ripped the veil. That last prayer ripped the veil. And you will rip it if you'll hang in there. You'll rip everything that's holding you back from what God has determined to give you. Say, I'm going to rip it. Oh, I didn't hear that good enough. That takes a determination that nothing can stop. And you'll rip everything that gets in front of you. Now he ever liveth to make intercession. Did he know what was important? He said prayer is a must. His miracles were preceded by prayer. And he said his excellence of character and his power and his miracles and his teaching. But the thing that impressed his apostles was his prayer life. I have given you an example. I must, I must, I must. Oh, the power, pastor, of your example. Teachers, leaders, evangelists. Jesus let his disciples see him in prayer. They knew why the miracles were coming, and they practiced it. He not only taught it, he practiced it. He exampled it in human shoes. He fleshed it out, and they could see the strength which it gave to his life. They saw it exampled. Why don't we try praying with such consistency and fervency until others ask, what's the secret of your life? I want to try living like you're living, because I must finish too. Go ahead and clap your hands and shout, I must. I must pray. All in the balcony. Don't hide up there. Clap your hands and shout, I must. Praying pulpits begets praying churches. So let the preachers weep between the porch and the altar. Example it. It's a must. It's a must. Wouldn't it be great if preachers took the lead as well as the reins? Wouldn't it be good if they took the lead as well as the reins? Wouldn't it be good if they took the lead as well as the reins as the church roars into the 21st century and we face one of the most difficult tests time has produced? Prayer must become a priority. 
Our two outreach men, Roger and Larry, is, they are teaching every individual in this church how to pray. Not just the new converts. They're going to be put into a, 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 a group, a Bible study group, and, and they're going to get out and pray with them and give them. Everybody's got to learn how to pray. We're tired of talking about it. Old timers, you're going to be taught how to pray. Whatever it takes to get us to praying, it'll be rejoicing time because whatever it took to get you on your knees, it'll be worth it. This local church is a consistent praying and fasting church and a soul winning church. Not enough. This church believes continual prayer and fasting brings continual revival. That's the only reason we're on this corner. This church is a compassionate, loving, merciful, forgiving, restoring church. This church is a resuscitating machine, if you will, when people are hit by that big truck. Because this is a Bible-believing church, and as such, we must adhere to Bible patterns. And in your Bible, it says, beginning with Exodus, down through Moses, Elijah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, the time of the law and the prophets, from the time of the exile and the time of the post-exile. And even in the early days of this great nation, they fasted and prayed. In the calamitous days of Jeremiah, the entire nation fasted and prayed. In Zechariah's day, there were stated days of prayer and fasting. Our Lord in human shoes fasted and prayed and told his disciples, How be it, this kind, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Anna the prophetess departed not from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. The early church prayed and fasted. As they prayed and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, over and over you'll read this, while they were praying, while he was praying, while they prayed the Holy Ghost said his face was transformed transfigured I'm telling you folks it's got to be in prayer for you to finish you're not going to finish if you don't pray you got to get your church to pray and you got to example it say I must Cornelius fasted and prayed saved his entire household and opened the door of the New Testament salvation to the Gentiles the Apostle Paul in fastings often approving ourselves in fastings and when they had ordained elders in every church they also instituted prayer and fasting in every church God Almighty said if I shut up the heaven that there be no rain if I command the locusts to devour the land if I send pestilence if my people say it if my people don't ever get over that. If you will, God will. I'm not going to finish the rest of that. If I will, God will. David humbled himself with prayer and fasting. Joel said, turn you with fastings and weepings. Daniel said, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. There is nothing that will stand before us if you'll hear me. Go tell that old fox. We're going to pray like we've never prayed. We're going to fast and pray. We're going to get together. We're going to get together. Come on and shout it with me, folks. We're going to pray together. We're going to fast together. We're going to believe together. It's your family. I know you do. It's coming. Fasting gives leverage to prayer. Fasting intensifies prayer. Prayer is so mighty an instrument that no one has ever thoroughly mastered all the keys. Prayer flies where the eagle never flew. That's why Joet said, I'd rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Don't call yourself a preacher if you're not a prayer warrior. You're a humbug. You're a humbug. You're a humbug. You're a walking fraud. You've got to get connected in. And I know that sounds funny, but that ain't funny. That ain't funny. You've been sent. And the first thing you're to do is to hit your knees every day, every day, every day, every day. Quit trying to keep up with the Joneses. Get your nose out of everybody else's business and quit trying to hear everything else and get on your knees and get God. Then you can start having revivals and miracles. Every door will open to you that God wants you to walk through. I believe every bit of that and I'm going to try to practice it. You may be seated. Pastor James said, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Paul, the great apostle, said, pray without ceasing. Have you ever tried that? Get into that war tongue. Just get into that war tongue. Hick a hack of a hoe. Just hick a hack of a hoe. Just drive down the road. Well, they see me in the, on the plane. They don't know. But I see them, and I don't like what I see. They don't have to like, but I'm getting in connect. I'm getting connected. I'm going to pray without ceasing some way or other. There's going to be something going up from my holy of holies. Put 
off the church to praying and you lead the way. Great churches are praying churches. Great preachers are praying preachers. Great saints are praying saints. You're no bigger than your altar. You never will be. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how much you can rattle off. If you hadn't prayed, I don't want to hear nothing you got to say. Because that's humanism. I want somebody connected if he says ain't and is and was and were. I like it. I like it done just right. But folks, give me somebody that's a shaking like a reed in the wind. Get your handkerchief out and say, get out of here, old fox. You go tell that old fox, you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm determined. Say, I'm determined. Now, you're taking my time, so you can sit down and keep your handkerchief ready. We may go down that rapids out there. We don't know. If John David Williams here, he remembers when I took my accordion and hid out the door because they couldn't break a revival. And I said, all of you orchestra, follow me. All of those saints that stayed home thought they'd get a good night's rest. We woke them up. They thought the Lord had come. It's time to wake up your city. Isaiah, look what he did and I ain't going to talk about it to wake up his city. Jeremiah took the most beautiful vase in the temple and slammed it against the city walls. Broke it. You may be seated. You said, what are you, what are you trying to get us to do? Be fanatics? Somebody's got to wake us up. And just good preaching because the greatest preachers in all the world in this room. And we've heard enough of preaching to save this whole world. I wish somebody would just show their fist to the devil and say, you gnarled looking son. I mean it. I mean it. Oh, that'd be my hero. I'd say, look at his biceps. Say, I'm going to get on his side. But let me tell you seriously, the prayer meeting is too lightly esteemed by too many among us. Say, the prayer meeting. In this church, it's too lightly esteemed. Prayer meetings are grounded in Scripture. Say, prayer meetings. On the evening of the resurrection Sabbath, Jesus appeared to his disciples in the upper room. They were gathered there for a prayer meeting. When the doors being shut, Jesus stood in their midst. Jesus stood in their midst in a prayer meeting. And when Jesus stands in your midst, anything can happen. And that's what I want to tell you. The church was born in a prayer meeting. You won't get away from that, ma'am, sir. You won't move off of that. Your church ain't going nowhere. All of your skills and organizational structure, it's great. And you got to do all of that. But it's got to be built on a foundation of prayer and that without ceasing. The apostolic church put the prayer meeting on an equality with the pulpit. For they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in... First of all... That's what is apostolic. First of all, prayer. The book of Acts is called the book of wonders in God, of God in the church. But if you read every chapter, you will find more prayers in it than miracles. That was the secret of the power of the miracles in the apostolic church. They followed the example. It was a must. And that's what we must do before God does. We must. We must assemble together in one mind and one accord in prayer meetings. Not talk sessions. Not any other kind of sessions. Not any other kind of sessions. Say prayer sessions. Prayer sessions. Not talking to everybody and looking who's... Get in touch with God and He'll shake the room. I want this place shaken before we leave here. By the time Stone King gets here Thursday night, I hope this place is shaken. That happened in Acts. The worshipers were refilled, enter positions of God's right hand in opening prisons, healing the sick, raising the dead. Do you want that? When you do, God will. Do you hear me? They ain't going to work without it. Do anything you want to do, you're going to come back to that. That's square one. They lived praying, they preached praying, they died praying and fighting. Prayer meetings brings unity. Unity brings strength and strength brings revival. Now you hear this. Jonathan Edwards first preached his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Strong men took hold of the pillars of the church to keep them from slipping into hell. A genuine revival was started. Little old bad eyes read every word of it. 
never making any exclamation points, but the force behind that one sermon was one man who stormed the gates of heaven through all of the previous night in the church that his pastor might preach in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God on the Sabbath. Edwards preached that sermon many times afterwards but with no visible results because that little man was not there praying. There was a lack of intercession and you can look into the history of church revivals. They began with prayer and ended because they neglected prayer. Souls are born when Zion travails and if some souls are being saved, it's Zion is not travailing. Don't blame it on nothing else. Don't point your finger at nothing else. It's because you're not praying. When you pray, souls are born. Clap your hands. Go tell that old fox. The prayer meeting is rooted in history. Following the apostolic period, believers met in humble places, in homes, in caves, and catacombs for prayer and praise. The great reformation was ushered in for prayer. In the days of the Wesleys, class meetings were organized, which met regularly for prayer and praise and say Bible study and testimony. Bible study every day. Prayer every day. Prayer every day. Bible study every day. And thus England was saved from revolution. A church committed to prayer and fasting and the word and witnessing will be a mighty church in any place. You don't have to believe it. Go tell that old fox I said it. Fulton Street prayer meeting in New York grew in numbers and in power until soon legislators in Albany were meeting in the morning for prayer. Teachers were bowing with their pupils in the classroom. Fishermen were kneeling among their nets. Sailors on the decks of their vessels. Simultaneously, prayer meetings were held for weeks and months in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, bringing multitudes to Jesus Christ. How bad do you want this? How bad? This meeting will do no good until we line up ourselves with what was determined. And I'm determined to make what he determined happen. Great evangelists of the past have always insisted that their preaching be preceded by prayer circles and union prayer meetings. Korean prayer meetings are awesome. Multiplied thousands praying day and night. Care what you think about it. They're praying. Hear me, every Friday night, an all-night prayer meeting of no less than 10,000. 10,000. 10,000. Now don't mock it until you try it. We need more prayer meetings. We need more days of fasting. We need more prayer meetings. United, shout it. We need more prayer meetings. Don't stop saying that for just a minute. Keep on saying it, pastors. Now get this, get this, Daniel 9, the Antichrist will make an agreement or covenant with the Jews. During the last seven years of tribulation, he will bargain for their wealth and they will be allowed to worship in Palestine, build their own temple and offer sacrifices and pray in the temple. The Antichrist will try to conquer the entire world and declare himself to be God, but something is wrong. He realizes that that something is wrong as those Jews praying and sacrificing in that temple. So his plans cannot be consummated as long as those Jews are sacrificing and praying. Can't stop us here. You can't stop us. You can talk about us all you want to. But if we're praying and humbling ourselves and getting rid of pride and all of that junk our general superintendent preached about last night, you can't stop us. You can't stop nobody that's praying and fasting, teaching the Word, and that's got all that junk out of them. Go ahead and wave your hands, little woman. Somebody's going to get what I'm talking about. Somebody's going to get it. It's junk. Pure junk. It's junk. You might as well get that junk out. Get that junk out. Get that junk out. He preached it. Did he preach it? Did he preach it? You better hear it and be determined to do it if you want to finish the race. Or it will be against your account. Okay, the Antichrist will then break the covenant in the middle of the week. And then, and then only, can the abomination of desolation spread throughout the world. Yeah. Hear me, abomination of desolation or prayer and fasting in your church. The desolator will get in that church if there's not prayer meetings. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Abomination will get in that church. The desolator will get in your home. Abomination of desolations will be in this city if we don't drive around every city binding every hellhole. 
I'm going to be a little lady, but let me just tell you strong. There's some strongholds in every city. And the abomination of desolation will take over if we do not, with prayer and fasting, bring every stronghold down. The Antichrist, as long as they're sacrificing, cannot set himself up as God. But when sacrifice stops, he can set himself up as God in the Jewish temple. Is that something? And declare his divine authority. Brother Anthony, I'm just about through. Give me just a few more minutes. In the sight of God, neither men nor devils can control a situation when men and women pray and sacrifice. That's enough for me. That's enough for me. Say, men, men. angels, men. or devils can't control a situation as long as I'm humbling myself and praying. Go tell that old fox I'm going to finish. Go tell that old fox I'm going to finish. Go tell him he's a liar. Go tell him he stinks. Go tell him he wallows in slander. You believe anything you want to believe about me or anything that's told. But if I'm praying and fasting and humbling myself, you ain't going to do nobody no harm but yourself. The devil knows that that's too devastating to wait. So that weapon of prayer and fasting is too powerful for the devil to not try to stop it. And that's why some of you came here hit by the big truck. It's going to work. That explosion is just about to happen. You don't have to believe me. You wait and see. That weapon of prayer and fasting is so powerful that the devil is trying his best to stop it. Satan's plan is to cause you and me to cease our prayer and fasting because as long as we are praying and fasting, he cannot get control. He can't get control in this place. I don't care how much he shows his head. We don't have to fool with him. All we got to do is pray and fast and God will handle him. He can't get control. That's why the one concern of the devil is to stop prayer meetings. When prayer and fasting ceases in this church, the desolator will bring in abomination of desolation. Don't ever trade prayer and fasting for desolation. Go tell that old fox what I did yesterday, I will do today, tomorrow, and the day following. Say, we must, we must. call for prayer meetings. Call for prayer meetings. Shout it. Say, we need prayer meetings. Let prayer meetings keep staying. With the march of events, we're limiting the Holy One of Israel by not having more prayer meetings. We're limiting the determinate counsel of God because we don't have enough of prayer meetings. Say, I'm determined. Say, I must pray. I must fast. Say, Daniel, determined to pray and fast. And say, he enforced it. Say, he enforced it. Say, I'm God's enforcer. I'm going to enforce God's determinate counsel. You tell that, and 21 days later, he said, I heard you the first time, but you kept on determining. Till God sent Michael and got him shook off, and then I got through. Yeah, yeah. Ain't that good? Glory. Just smile a little bit. If I keep on, Michael will finally shake him off up there and say, get out of the way. That's my man. Yeah. He's determined. Yeah. Ain't that good? Shake your head like this and say, that's good. <laughs> Got to keep you woke up. Abraham determined, say, I'm getting Lot and my family out of there. Say, I'm going to enforce it. Jacob determined, and you don't ever trust a man that ain't got his hip thrown out of joint. Don't trust him, because until you get your hip thrown out of joint, you're no good. You haven't prevailed with God nor man, and your name hasn't even been changed, and you're nothing but a swindler. You need your thigh thrown out of joint. I know I, I know I believe that. Follow somebody that walks with a limp. That's right. Follow somebody that walks with a limp. Yeah. Esther said, call a prayer meeting. Yeah. Esther said, call a prayer meeting because if you don't, I'm going to perish. If you don't call some prayer meetings, you're going to perish. Because the desolator is going to get in there. I must save my people. But say she enforced it. Yeah. Call a prayer meeting. I'm going in now after the prayer meeting and after the fasting because I must enforce I must spare this people that's got the uh, determinate counsel of God wrapped up in it that's going to deliver it to the next one. Enforce it. Paul said to all the churches, call a prayer meeting for me, pray for me. Have you ever tried that, Pastor? Instead of just laying everybody in the shade, won't you call a prayer meeting and say, pray for me? I can't handle this. It's too big for me. That's the only way these pastors have ever handled it. We can't handle them. We can't handle them. You can't match wits with them. 
No. But God's given you some mighty weapons. Call a prayer meeting and every devil will find it. You can't handle it. You can't handle it. You can't handle it. You can't handle it. I must save my people from destruction. I must stir myself up to take hold of God. I must have a revival. I must break up my fallow ground. Come on and talk with me. Say, I must. Break up my fallow ground for the former rain and the latter rain for refreshing from the presence of the Lord and a revival. I must stand in the gap. I must intercede for the lost and my family. I must. I must. I'm going to leave some of that. I must. I must. I must. I must. Abraham still standing. Aaron running with a censer. And we need somebody pleading here today. We need somebody appealing. We need we need somebody standing in the gap. We need some human shoes here today. We need some more interceding. Don't destroy the inheritance of the Lord. He can gather up water that's spilt on the ground. That little woman from the city of Abel looked at that ruthless Joab, bloody man, and said, The inheritance of the Lord is in this little city. Don't st- destroy this city. And that man just crumbled at that intercessor. We're the enforcers of God's determinate will. Say, We must. We can. We will. will. Paul said, I fought, but I kept the faith. You go tell that old fox, I finished. You haven't reached your city yet. And if you haven't reached your family and your neighborhood, because of the times 93 tells you, you go tell that old fox. What I did yesterday, I'm going to do today. I'm going to recapture my dream. And I'm going to leave here telling that devil, get out of my way. I'm going to call prayer meetings. I'm going to finish the determinate counsel of God, and I'm not stopping. From 1985 to 1991, Terry Anderson, hostage in Beirut, crocheted chessboards, cards, and even rosary beads from rubber. David Jacobson, a conservative Republican. Terry Anderson, another hostage in in Beirut, a liberal Democrat were chained together for 19 months, day and night. But politics didn't matter then. That is right. He said, all that mattered then is I want that Bible they gave me, and I want you and I to bind together in prayer. He said, I got so, so hurt in December 1987 when Anderson was forbidden to send a Christmas message to his family. He slammed his head against the wall until the blood streamed down. I saw a man out of Brother Anthony's church in Plano that came here for a while before he went back and established and it's got as good a church in that area as is going. I saw him in that old G.A. Mangan prayer room pray until blood ran down out of his nose. It even ran down out of his mouth. But that boy said, I'm hostage to some circumstances and situations, but my ministry is going to blossom forth. I must. It's determined that I do. It's determined. It's de- he beat his head against that wall. He beat his hands. You say, does it take that? No. But a determinate will mixed with his determinate counsel and foreknowledge, you will arrive and you will finish. He said, I was near to despair, but I don't think I ever quite gave up because... I had my Bible in one hand and I never quit praying. I never quit praying. You want to come out of your situation? What's got you hostaged today? What's got you incarcerated? What's got you ready to beat your head against the wall? What motorcycle has hit you? Would you stand and sing with me? It's 
determined. 